I love rascals, and I am enjoying the one amongst us this month of July. Reverend Richard Levy is currently the senior minister in Wilmington, North Carolina, partnering with his beloved wife, Maureen. Their journey began a few years ago. As young adults, a dramatic experience brought to their attention the possibility of something larger than just the lives they were living. That led them to study Buddhism, a Course in Miracles, Paramahansa Yogananda, Edgar Casey, Science of Mind, and then he was finally ready to embrace unity, because that's when he found it, at the end of all of that list, embracing all of the teachings, all of the wisdom that he had gathered within himself. Reverend Richard Levy went to seminary at Unity Village, where he was ordained in 1981. Since then, he and Maureen have served churches in Hawaii, California, Washington, and now currently for several years they've been in North Carolina. I'm delighted that he is with us for part of our summer sabbatical energy season. Will you welcome with me the wise and rascally Reverend Richard Levy? <laughs> I like the wise and rascally better than, what did you call me, an imp last week? Is that a compliment? It is. Don't you be calling me no wimp, no small guy. Hey, if I had my sleeves rolled up, you'd see I belong with the brothers, all right? So today's talk is called The, the Story of Pi, and it actually comes out of the movie The Life of Pi, and it comes out of a metaphysical interpretation from Maureen. We had gone to go see the movie with Maureen's sister Joanne and Chris, and they'd seen it the day before, and they said, we want to see this movie with you. And when we got home, Maureen came up with this idea for all the different meanings that could be possible for us for this wonderful mystery mythical story of our own divine awakening. And it begins where a lot of things do, this story of your present incarnation. It, it, it starts with suffering, suffering. When it's time to suffer, you should suffer. And when it's time to cry, you should cry. And when you cry, cry completely. Cry until there are no more tears, and then recognize in your exhaustion that you're still alive. The sun still rises and sets, the seasons come and go, and absolutely nothing remains the same, and that includes suffering. When the suffering ends, wisdom begins to rise up within your consciousness. Buddha said, I teach two things, suffering and the end of suffering. And sometimes you really can't be aware of one without the other. It starts off with that. Many people come into unity because they're suffering with the life that they're living right now. So our story here begins with a 16-year-old boy named Pi. And at 16 years old, he's on a journey on a boat with his family who are leaving India to go to the United States with all of their animals from a zoo they had in India. And, and this terrible storm comes up, storm number one in our story. And what happens is the, the ship goes down. Do we all know that feeling of the ship? going down, and he's in about 18 feet of water, and Ang Lee does an amazing job with this movie. I read good books, and I don't want to go to the movies. This book was as good, if not even better, than the movie, and it's that one scene, and I know you know this place, where he's looking at his whole life go down the drain. But he relate to that? Everything is gone. His mother, his father, his siblings, the zoo, everything goes down the drain. And when he pops back up again, as you always do, what he's left with is a rife, life raft and a 700-pound Bengal tiger named Richard Parker, who he's got to deal with. Now, this, this Richard Parker, this Bengal tiger, is not Mohini from last week going back and forth in a capture. This is a full-fledged eye of the tiger rawr, energy that you and I are called upon to deal with in our own life. You don't leave that energy behind. 
that eye of the tiger, which represents the, the first three lower centers, the sensation, security, and power centers. We don't leave those things behind to become all lovey and dovey and awakened. We have to bring that energy up to the heart to lift our energy up, to lift up the kundal, the mana, the prana, the chi, or what we call in this tradition, the Holy Spirit. That's our work. We don't leave that behind. What we do is we transform the eye of the tiger into the eye of awakening. Yeah, because when your eye be single, Jesus said, your whole body will be filled with light, 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 and life and energy. But it doesn't get there by denying any part of your human self. None of us get to do that. We all get to integrate this eye of the tiger, this energy that wants to attack and claw and seeks to eat and ravage everything. It's our instinctual nature. It doesn't go away. It just eats and is eaten. It's not bad or good, it just is part of what being human is all about. We'll get back to the story of Pi in a moment, now back to the story of me, myself, and I. So um, I make a big deal, sorry, you're, we're almost done, only one more Sunday. Um, and we, we, got, we got my birthday coming up, which is always a big deal for me. Um, I just turned 63, and every, every year, um, I try to ask myself, well, what is the big thing I'm working on right now in my life? And as we get towards the other part of the dash, we know we're on this part of the dash. <laughs> you know you are. Well, what is it for me? And I asked that question, and the answer I got was the concept of anatta, which is the Buddhist concept of no self, no self. That little part of us, that infinitesimal ripple that declares in its arrogance, it's the whole ocean, the tiniest sunbeam, believing it's the whole sun, that's what A Course in Miracles says, that's that self that we believe ourselves to be. It isn't bad, it isn't good, it's just what we believe ourselves to be. So as you get older, you begin to take a look at the self that begins to start to dissolve. Hello? <laughs> the story changes. Uh, that was my, my lesson. So, and this is also the lesson of your present incarnation. It's your lesson in the story of Pi. So here he is. He's got to deal with this energy on the life raft. And he gets up on the life raft. He doesn't know yet about the surprise underneath the canvas he's standing on top of. He does know about the hyena and the zebra and the monkey. And, and there's an amazing scene where... The hyena goes after the, the zebra and eats it alive, and then the monkey's trying to stop the, the hyena, and then the hyena kills the monkey, and then all of a sudden we believe the next thing that's going to happen is good, goodbye pie, short movie, we're out of here. But that's not what happens. That energy from below the belt buckle, from the spinal column, the deep part placed with us, instinctual nature, it, in that moment, rah! It jumps out. And that scene, I screamed. There was a little kid at the first service. He went, I screamed doing that. I screamed. And I said, I screamed too. My heart was going boom, 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 boom. And literally, psh, that hyena is gone. And what do you think he does next? He does what tigers do. He takes a look at his next meal. Pie. And pie does what you and I would do. He gets off that boat really quickly and leaves that situation behind. I want to say sometimes it's really important for us to get away from our current situation. He, he, leaves, he leaves himself onto a little series of oars and some life rafts that he ties together, and he pulls himself away from his current situation. It's very important that we all have times that we do that in our life, and I know that's what Sky's doing now. He's having time to be away from this job, which friends can be all-consuming. I can see him looking refreshed. He's getting, he's getting filled with the vibrancy of spirit so we can come back and share that with you. God bless you all for giving him that opportunity to do that because we all need it. This is tough work, my friends. And so when he comes back, he'll be able to share that energy with you. So while he's there on this life raft, he notices this metal box, and in it, he opens it up. There's a service manual on how to exist um, on the sea of existence, consciousness, and bliss to live and, and survive. And so he opens it up, the service manual, and I really believe that when you come to Unity, we provide you with that service manual right here. Prayer and meditation and Vipassana and classes with Marge and Ed and all the great teachers here, the prayers that we do. It gives you a service manual. And in this manual, it starts off by saying four things. The first thing it says is, don't give up hope. Yes? Second thing it says is, don't live in the past. It's over. 
Don't spend a lot of time hallucinating about the future. Keep your energy focused in the present moment and do what you can do right here and right now to stay alive. That sounds like our teaching, right? Do what you can do in this present incarnation to stay alive. And so he discovers uh, there's a fish line and a fish hook. He is a complete and total vegetarian. He has been his whole life. He's never eaten anything alive, a piece of meat. And it's an am amazing line where he goes, you won't believe what you're capable of doing if you get hungry enough. Great line. And so he drops the hook in the water and he, he pulls up his, his first piece of meat that he's ever had in his whole life, this huge tuna fish. And he's got an ax that he got from the metal thing. And he has to kill this, this animal. He's never done this before. And yet a part of him knows he's got to do it to survive. And so he does this incredible bowing to the presence of the life force in this animal that will feed him. And he kills that animal. And he eats it and, and finds life in it. But he still has to deal with Richard Parker. Because, you know, Bengal tigers, they swim. <laughs> and if they get hungry enough, guess what? They'll swim and get you on your life raft, no matter how far away you go. And so in that moment, he realizes he has got to feed a, feed, find a way to feed this part of his own energy, as you do too. You've got to find a way to feed this part of yourself, but on your terms. And so he begins to bring fish over to Richard Parker to keep him from swimming and over and eating him. Richard still won't let him on, on the boat, but yet he's feeding him now, so he's kind of satisfied to a certain degree, and they sort of work out a relationship. And then what happens next is storm number two happens in your life. You think you're all settled down, you got it all worked out, and what does life do? Another storm comes along, and this is a whopper of a storm, and he ends up getting on the boat, and Richard Parker is like this little mouse washing back and forth in a swimming pool. The storm is so, so bad and so terrible, and he's holding on for dear life, and, and, and Pi is holding on for dear life, and then what happens next, as always, the storm, it settles down. No matter what you're going through, you're going to get through it. It does settle down. And, and at that moment, everything settles down. And when he's back in the boat again, he realizes that what he thinks might be his problem is no longer on the boat. Richard Parker has gone overboard and can't get back up. There's an amazing moment in the movie of your life, your present incarnation, where it looks like you've got this problem. It's this pesty ego that keeps showing up at the wrong time, giving you wrong information, eating and shining its nails and clawing people to death. If I could just get rid of this, and he's got the, and I don't know what I would have done in that moment. He has the ax up like this. Maybe I'll just kill this problem and get rid of it. Anybody ever thought you might like to try that sometime? Well, that's not the way to get rid of it, my friends. The way to get rid of it is not to get rid of it, but to integrate it. And so he, again, makes a path for the animal to come back on the life raft and share this place with him. But he's also kicked off again. <laughs> Darn this animal. So there's one moment where he's sitting on this, you know this ego. There's one moment where he's, it's, it's the middle of the night, and it's like a Hawaii perfect night, like, like maybe last night. The full moon is out, and the stars are shining, and, and Richard Parker is, is sitting. Um, straight and, and erect. He owns that life raft. He knows he owns that life raft. And then there's Pi, who's meditating and deciding, taking a few classes at Unity, you know, going to Oneness University. You know something? I have got to integrate this animal in my life. Otherwise, I'm not going to have a life, and I'm going to die, and he's going to die. He decides the next morning to take dominion over the situation. He's got a bunch of fish in his back pocket, and he gets... He gets a boat hook. This is actually a, a broom from the house I'm staying in. And he jumps up on top of this incredible energy that he's got to control now. And with the fish and a whistle, and I've had a whistle. I brought this whistle 5,000 miles with me. It's the greatest part of the talk. I left it on the big island. Will you be my whistles? <laughs> whistle with me now. He whistles. I'm sorry, Sky, I want to hurt you at the desk. Like he slams on it and he throws the fish down. Keep whistling and keeps whistling. And for about two hours, he trains. That's enough. He trains this energy <laughs> to no longer control him. He takes the energy of this base chakra and, and leads it underneath the canvas tent which you must do as well, too. He doesn't get rid of it, but he lives with it on his terms, not its terms. The tiger in your tank, friends, is, is a, great, a great servant, but a lousy master. 
And so in that moment, he has mastered that energy. So you'd think that that would be the end, right? You finally went through Mary Morrissey's Prosperity Plus program. You're doing pretty good. You're manifesting some stuff. You've gotten pretty prayerful. You're sitting in meditation. You can do 45 minutes without flinching. And then life throws you number three, another storm. Well, what the heck is this about? What, me? Why me? Why me? Another storm comes. And this time, it's even bigger than the storm before that. And they're being thrown around all over the place. And again, Richard Parker's bouncing all over the place like a little mouse in a swimming pool. And he's standing there having a moment that all of us have on this work, on the path. A moment where he starts to scream at God. My God, my God, why hast, like Jesus said, thou for Saken me. What is this? I gave up my family. I gave up my life in India. All the animals are gone. Everything I know is finished. I got a relationship with this, this nature in me. And now, now I get this. You know that feeling? And a part of him in screaming out exhausts himself. Like our first quote says, he's exhausted. And yet at the same time, in giving up and surrendering and letting go, he's also awakened in the same moment. And, and he gets, he gets an illuminating moment. And then he does what we all do. He prays, my beloved, if it be thy will, not my will but thine be done, I would, I would love for something to show up right now that might help me here, a place where I could live and move and have my being. And then he wakes up and then they land on the island of Kauai with nobody there. They land on Oahu before all of us 800,000 people got here. And it's this beautiful, gorgeous, incredible island. It's got everything you need, they need to exist. Richard Parker jumps off, and there are these little cute little mercats on the island, and he just bleh, eats them, eats them. They don't, even, they, don't have, they don't even resist because they're not used to seeing anybody. And so his belly is full, and then he, Pie, gets down on the ground, and he realizes, wow, wow, vegetables. <laughs> The whole island is a vegetable and fruit. And he begins to eat the papaya and the mango. And this is so good. I don't have to kill anything. I'll be all full. Beware of paradise. You know when you moved to Hawaii, you thought everything was going to be perfect, didn't you? I know I moved here a bunch of years ago. And about two weeks later, four weeks later, Matson showed up and dropped my stuff off again. And it was right back to being me. You know that happens to all of us. Beware of thinking you're done because you're not ever done until you're done. And even then you're not done because we keep growing. There's no other way here. It's lifting up the energy. It just gets more and more and more subtle. So he's sleeping up on a tree with the meerkats. And he notices this instinctual part of our being, Richard, Richard Parker, is not sleeping on the island. He's sleeping on the life raft. He must know something. And he finds out he does know something, that the island what looks like paradise, has a terrible secret. At night, it eats everything alive that's on the island. Ooh. And he knows he needs to get off that island. For us, what that tells us is no matter what plateau you might be at, it, it's never done. you got to keep growing. Paradise is not something that happens externally to you. It's something that happens internally inside of you. And you take that with you wherever you go. So now they're off. They're both off now, and, and, and they're heading out in a new direction. And everything's running out. Water's running out. Food's running out. And another... And well, what? Now this is just ridiculous. I need a storm on top of all this. More suffering, more storm comes. But they've got principles that they've anchored themselves in. So things are changing, and yet they're not. And the very things that you think are going to last forever, don't. And so in that moment, when the storm is over, they're both exhausted, they're tired, and they're starving, and they have no water left. And another big mystical moment happens of integration of all of ourselves. There's that moment when he's opened and surrendered, and, and Richard Parker, this huge tiger that's now 200 pounds emaciated, is, is sitting next to him, lying next to him. He can't move. He takes the head of this huge tiger and puts it on his lap and gently strokes it, makes it a part of his being. Now, now there's no more Richard Parker and Pi. There's only the essence and energy of the presence. He's integrated that part into himself. And whether he lives or dies, it doesn't matter at that point because he's become a complete whole human being. And when the next moment happens, as it does, they wake up and, and they're on uh, the shore of Mexico to be rescued. Now the powerful image. And he crawls off the boat and he's just starving. And then Richard, Richard Parker, which represents that part of our being, who's now 200 pounds, jumps over the top 
of, of his head and walks off into the forest, the forest, the jungle, and he never looks back. And there's a part of Pi, you and I, that goes, what? After all of that? No wink? <laughs> no thank you? No domo arigato sensei? Nothing? N nothing. Th th that part just walks off and is gone. What, what the, what, is that what I get from doing all this spiritual work? How about a, the ego cannot congratulate you because it isn't real. <laughs> it just walks off for a while and leaves you alone till tomorrow morning. <laughs> till somebody cuts you off in traffic. Until you find out your ticket's not any good for the plane reservation tomorrow. Until someone pushes your button. Yes, that's how this works here, friends. You get to do it again and again and again. You can't receive from the ego, friends, what you want. What you can do is give yourself what you are from the presence of what you are, and then you can continually evolve and awaken all parts of your own being. So it's the end, it's the end of, of our story with him sitting in a hospital bed, and there, there are two men there who represent the shipping company who are sitting there, and they're, they're telling him, tell us what happened. You're the only person who lived through this. So he says, the story I just told you. It was a story of miracles. Amazing things showed up in my life. It was just, it was suffering, but there was moments of illumination and awakening, and I, I had this relationship. He tells the whole story I just told you. One of miracles happening everywhere. And the two men who represent egoic collective consciousness, race mind, that Charles Fillmore call it, they go, we don't believe that story. Tell us another story. Just like your friends, and when you tell them what's going on in unity and what you're practicing here, that you're practicing the presence of something greater than just yourself, you tell them all about unity and what the talk was about today, they look at you like you've gone cuckoo, crazy. You know, they don't understand. The ego doesn't understand. They say, we want another story. So he gives them what they want, another story. He said, we were all on the boat. And it wasn't a bunch of animals. It was myself and my mother, and it was my father. And we all turned into cannibals. And we started eating each other alive. And the only one left at the end standing was me. And you know what ego says to that, collective race mind? That's a story I can get into. <laughs> you hear that now? That's what it does. You and I stand at a choice point every day. What story do you want to come from? Is life filled with miracles and wonder and glory? Is, is the universe working on your behalf saying yes? Or is it filled with you only go around once in life, you grab all the gusto you can, you use your claws and you fight? If you want to believe that that's true, you'll get the results of that in your life. You always have a choice. So back to, back to the story of me again. It's my birthday, and I love to have my daughter come and join me for my birthday because I moved to North Carolina so we could be together for my birthdays and stuff, but she knows how important it is. So I get an email from her, and she says to me, uh, Dear Dad, uh, the weekend's very busy, and I'm doing something with Jim and Emerson and soccer games and tennis games. We can't come for your birthday. And I had just had people at my house for a week, and you all know about company. We live here, you have company all the time at your house, right? And so I went, well... Okay, but I could feel myself, my claws were starting to come out like this, but I went, yeah, we're kind of busy, and yeah, all right, <sighs> I can let that go, take a deep breath, and I'm okay, I'm all right, but then she, four hours later, sends me an email, Dad, you know those Harley Davidson new pegs you want for the front of your motorcycle? I've looked them up on, on, online, and there's like 500 sets of different pegs to get. You need to choose which ones you want, and you got to do it fast, because I'm very busy, and I want to get this present off to you. And I go, Rah! How dare you? You're not going to my party, and now you're going to tell me i got to hurry up and get the thing done so you can finish it up? This is me, my birthday, how about me? And I send her back an email. Uh, Dear Maura, my beloved one in whom I'm not well pleased. You don't need to get me anything for my birthday. The pegs on my bike are perfect just as they are. Don't even, don't, don't trouble yourself, darling. Dad. Now I have, I have leaped and I have sharpened and I have gone for the jugular and we're not talking for two days. But then I remembered, oh, grasshopper, wait a minute. You asked for the presence to give you the gift of what your life is about now. Oh, that's right. It's about Anada, no self. So I wrote my daughter this email. Dear Mora, 
Each year on my birthday, I ask what might be the major focus for this year's teaching. Um, the one that came up is the concept of anatta, of no self. The last thing to surrender on the path of awakening is the idea that we are somebody very important that must have all of their needs met all the time or we won't be happy, period. As I get older, I'm realizing there's no way that this list can ever be fulfilled. To surrender to what is in any given moment is easy to say. I say it in front of hundreds of people every week, but I'm telling you, friends, it's the hardest thing sometimes to practice. Thank you for giving me the greatest birthday gift that I ask for, the understanding that I am not this self that I defend, and if you don't come for my birthday, I still can have a wonderful day with or without you. Yes, that's the practice. So let's go to our lesson summation. We'll finish up, and I'll get done screaming and spitting at you. When it's time to suffer, you should suffer. And when it's time to cry, you should cry. Cry completely. <laughs> cry until there are no more tears, and then recognize in your complete exhaustion that you're still alive. The sun still rises and sets, the seasons come and go, and absolutely nothing remains the same, and that will include your suffering. When the suffering ends, wisdom begins to raise and lift up the energy in you to ask the right questions. And again, Jesus said, if thy eye be single, thy whole body will be filled with light. And remember, I want you to use, and I know you will, you will use and abuse the stick for mindfulness. A lot of it uses to beat people up with it, but it's not what we're talking about today. Use the stick of mindfulness to blow the whistle, blow the whistle on the tiger. Believe it or not, I lost two hours of sleep last night beating myself up because I didn't bring the stupid whistle with me. I said, this is completely ridiculous. It doesn't matter. But yet, my, you hear what I'm saying? When you get caught, you just go, oh, another one. Use the stick of mine. Thank you for sharing. I didn't bring the stick. I, for, I forgot about it. You can get back underneath now so I don't have to lose all my energy and all my sleep over a meaningless detail of something that's not important. Use the stick of mindfulness in your present incarnation to blow the whistle on yourself, to develop a relationship with this part of your being. And remember, it's not about getting rid of the eye of the tiger, but transforming it, its energy, into the eye of the awakening process you're involved with. Yes, this is thy rod and thy staff. Let these teachings comfort you, and may you be led into the holy land, the promised land of awakening to who you truly are, and help all the other animals in the zoo to join you as well. So let's take a few moments to breathe together and slow down. And just be present in this moment. What inside of you is part of your eye of the tiger? That part of you that, that you're still pushing away. That part of you that unconsciously projects out to others and in moments wants to rip them apart. It's not, not separate from you. It's part of you. So we allow this energy this sweet presence, to be lifted up in us, to be embraced it, to put the tiger's head on our lap, to feel the energy of the tiger, the eye of the tiger, merging with the heart chakra, to feel that energy in the heart chakra moving up to the throat, to the place of surrender, to the single eye of spirit. And then you become a wholly integrated human being this practice of mindfulness and awakening, you will need to practice for the rest of your life. But when you begin to experience the fruits of your choices, to live life as a miracle every day, you'll want to continue to do just that. Take a few moments in the silence to allow the eye of the tiger to be transformed to the eye of illumination.